Chapter Three: The Depths of the blue, Deep Blue Sea. Captain Bill stood up in the boat as if undecided what to do. Never a sailorman was more bewildered than this old fellow by the strangeness of the adventure he had encountered. At first, he could hardly believe it was all true, and that he was not dreaming, but there was Trot in the water, laughing with the mermaids and floating comfortably about, and he couldn't leave his dear little companion to make the trip to the depths of the ocean alone. "'Take my hand, please, Cap'n Bill,' said Princess Clea, reaching her dainty arm toward him, and suddenly the old man took courage and clasped the soft fingers in his own. He had to lean over the boat to do this, and then there came a queer lightness to his legs, and he had a great longing to be in the water. So he gave a flop and flopped in beside Trot, where he found himself comfortable enough, but somewhat frightened. Law sakes, he gasped, here's me in the water with my rheumatics. I'll be that stiffer tomorrow or I can't wiggle. You're wiggling all right now, observed Trot. That's a fine tail you've got, Cap'n, and its green scales is just beautiful. Are they green, eh? He asked, twisting round to try to see them. Green as emeralds, Cap'n. How do they feel? Feel, Trot? Feel? Why, this tail beats that old wooden leg all holler. I can do stunts now that I couldn't have done a thousand years with that old peg. And don't be afraid of the rheumatism, advised the princess. No mermaid ever catches cold or suffers pain in the water. Is Cap'n Bill a mermaid now? asked Trot. Why, he's a merman, I suppose, laughed the pretty princess. But when he gets home, he'll be just Cap'n Bill again. Wooden leg and all, inquired the child. To be sure, my dear. The sailor was now trying his newly discovered powers of swimming and became astonished at the feats he could accomplish. He could tart this way and that way with wonderful speed and turn and dive and caper about in the water far better than he had ever been able to do on land, even before he got the wooden leg. And a curious thing about this present experience was that the water did not cling to him and wet him as it had always done before. He still wore his flannel shirt and pea jacket and his sailor cap, but although he was in the water and had been underneath the surface, the cloth still seemed dry and warm. As he dived down and came up again, the drops flashed from his head and the fringe of beard, but he never needed to wipe his face or eyes at all. Trot, too, was having queer experiences and enjoying them. When she ducked underwater, she saw plainly everything around her, as easily and distinctly as she had ever seen anything above water. And by looking over her shoulder, she could watch the motion of her new tail, all covered with pretty iridescent pink scales, which gleamed like jewels. She wore her dress the same as before, and the water failed to affect it in the least. She now noticed that the mermaids were clothed too, and their exquisite gowns were the loveliest things the little girl had ever beheld. They seemed made of a material that was like sheeny silk, cut low in the neck and with wide flowing sleeves that seldom covered the shapely white arms of her new friends. The gowns had trains that floated far behind the mermaids as they swam, but were so fleecy and transparent that the sparkle of their scales might be seen reaching back of their waists where the human form ended and the fish part began. The sea fairies were strings of splendid pearls twined around their throats, while more pearls were sewn upon their gowns for trimmings. They did not dress their beautiful hair at all, but let it float around them in clouds. The little girl had scarcely time to observe all this when the princess said, now, my dear, if you are ready, we will begin our journey, for it is a long way to our palaces. All right, answered Trot, and took the hand extended to her with a trustful smile. Will you allow me to guide you, Cap'n Bill? asked the blonde mermaid, extending her hand to the old sailor. Of course, ma'am, he said, taking her fingers rather bashfully. My name is Merla, she continued, and I am cousin to Princess Clea. We must keep together, you know, and I will hold your hand to prevent your missing the way. While she spoke, they began to descend through the water, and it grew quite dark for a time because the cave shut out the light. 
but presently Trot, who was eagerly looking around her, began to notice the water lighten and saw they were coming into brighter parts of the sea. We have left the cave now, said Clea, and may swim straight home. I suppose there are no winding roads in the ocean, remarked the child, swimming swiftly beside her new friend. Oh, yes, indeed. At the bottom, the way is far from being straight or level, replied Clea. But we are in midwater now, where nothing will hinder our journey, unless... She seemed to hesitate, so Trot asked, unless what? Unless we meet with disagreeable creatures, said the princess. The midwater is not as safe as the very bottom, and that is the reason we are holding your hands. What good would that do? asked Trot. You must remember that we are fairies, said Princess Clea. For that reason, nothing in the ocean can injure us. But you too are mortals, and therefore not entirely safe at all times unless we protect you. Trot was thoughtful for a few moments and looked around her a little anxiously. Now and then a dark form would shoot across their pathway or pass them at some distance, but none was near enough for the girl to see plainly what it might be. Suddenly they swam right into a big school of fishes, all yellow tails and of very large size. There must have been hundreds of them lying lazily in the water, and when they saw the mermaids, they merely wiggled to one side and opened a pathway for the sea fairies to pass through. Will they hurt us? asked Trot. No, indeed, laughed the princess. Fishes are stupid creatures mostly, and this family is quite harmless. How about sharks? asked Cap'n Bill, who was swimming gracefully beside them, his hand clutched in that of pretty Merla. Sharks may indeed be dangerous to you, replied Clea, so I advise you to keep them at a safe distance. They never dare attempt to bite a mermaid, and it may be they will think you belong to our band, but it is well to avoid them if possible. Don't get careless, Cap'n, added Trot. I surely won't, mate, he replied. You see, I didn't used to be afraid of sharks, because if they came near me, I'd stick my wooden leg at them. But now, if they happens to fancy these green scales, it's all up with old Bill. Never fear, said Merla. I'll take care of you on your our journey, and in our palaces you will find no sharks at all. Can't they get in? he asked anxiously. No, the palaces of the mermaids are inhabited only by themselves. Is there anything else to be afraid of in the sea? asked the little girl after they had swum quite a while in silence. One or two things, my dear, answered Princess Clea. Of course, we mermaids have great powers being fairies. Yet among the sea people is one nearly as powerful as we are, and that is the devil fish. I know, said Trot, I've seen them. You have seen the smaller ones, I suppose which sometimes rise to the surface or go near shore and are often caught by fishermen, said Clea. But they are only second cousins of the terrible deep sea devilfish to which I refer. Those ones are bad enough, though, declared Cap'n Bill. If you know any worse ones, I don't want an introduction to them. The monster devilfish inhabit caves in the rugged mountainous regions of the ocean, resumed the princess, and they are evil spirits who delight in injuring all who meet them. None lives near our palaces, so there is little danger of your meeting any while you are our guests. I hope we won't, said Trot. None for me, added Cap'n Bill. Devils of any sort ought to be given a wide berth, and devil fishes is worse or near ser serpents. Oh, do you know the sea serpents, asked Merla, as if surprised. Not much, I don't, answered the sailor, but I've heard tell of folks as have seen them. Do they ever live to tell the tale, asked Trot. Sometimes, he replied. They're just or fool creatures, mate. How easy it is to be mistaken, said Princess Clea softly. We know the sea serpents very well, and we like them. You do, exclaimed Trot. Yes, dear. There are only three of them in all the world, and not only are they harmless, but quite bashful and shy. They are kind-hearted, too, and although not beautiful in appearance, they do many kind deeds and are generally beloved. Where do they live? asked the child. 
The oldest one, who is king of this ocean, lives quite near to us, said Clea. His name is Anko. How old is he? inquired Cap'n Bill curiously. No one knows. He was here before the ocean came, and he stayed here because he learned to like the water better than the land as a habitation. Perhaps King Anko is 10,000 years old, perhaps 20,000. We often lose track of the centuries down here in the ocean. That's pretty old, isn't it? said Trot. Older than Cap'n Bill, I guess. Sama chuckled the salmon. Sama older mate, but not much. Perhaps the sea serpent ain't got gray whiskers. Oh, yes, he has, responded Merlin with a laugh. And so have his two brothers, Unko and Inko. They each have an ocean of their own, you know. And once every hundred years, they come here to visit their brother, Anko. So we've seen all three many times. Why, how old are mermaids then? Asked Trot, looking round at the beautiful creatures wonderingly. We are like all ladies of uncertain age, rejoined the princess with a smile. We don't care to tell. Older than Cap'n Bill? Yes, dear, said Clea. But we haven't any gray whiskers, added Merla merrily, and our hearts are ever young. Trot was thoughtful. It made her feel solemn to be in the company of such old people. The band of mermaids seemed to all appearances young and fresh and not a bit as if they'd soaked in water for hundreds of years. The girl began to take more notice of the sea maidens following after her. More than a dozen were in the group, all very lovely in appearance and clothed in the same gauzy robes as Merla and the princess. These attendants did not join in a conversation, but darted here and there in sportive play, and often Trot heard the tinkling chorus of their laughter. Whatever doubts might have arisen in the child's mind through the ignorant tales of her sailor friend, she now found the mermaids to be light-hearted, joyous, and gay, and from the first she had not been in the least afraid of her new companions. How much further do we have to go? asked Captain Bill presently. Are you getting tired? Merlin inquired. No, said he, but I'm sort of anxious to see what your palaces look like. Inside the water ain't as interesting as the top of it. It's fine swimming, I'll agree, and I like it, but there ain't nothing special to see that I can make out. That is true, sir, replied the princess. We have purposely led you through the midwater, hoping you would see nothing to alarm you until you get more accustomed to our ocean life. Moreover, we are able to travel more swiftly here. How far do you think we have already come, Captain? Oh, about two miles, he answered. Well, we are now hundreds of miles from the cave where we started, she told him. You don't mean it, he exclaimed in wonder. Then there's magic in it, announced Trot soberly. True, my dear. To avoid tiring you and to save time, we have used a little of our fairy power, said Clea. The result is that we are nearing our home. Let us go downward a bit now, for you must know that the mermaid palaces are at the very bottom of the ocean and in its deepest part. 